check this out. See if you can see this on camera. So, is that visible? <laughs> this is going to be a fun one, but not for any of the good reasons. This is an MSI Aegis R. It's a pre-built computer. We spent $1,750 US dollars on it, and it is easily one of the worst computers we've ever worked on. Uh, there are many things wrong with this. It's not just the easy stuff, like the fact that it can't breathe, it's completely restricted in airflow. No, that would be too low hanging. The problems for this one go far beyond that. Uh, MSI has built a custom power profile in Windows that tricks the CPU into thinking it's under 100% load. Even when you're transferring a file, it has managed to uh, screw up the BIOS settings. It's installed so much bloatware that the system is constantly doing something. And it even has a bent SSD. So you know where this one's going. Before that, this video is brought to you by Thermal Grizzly. Thermal Grizzly's Hydronaut and Cryonaut thermal pastes are high-performing thermal interfaces for use on CPUs and GPUs. You can bring an old card back to peak performance by repasting it and doing preventative maintenance, and Thermal Grizzly's Hydronaut is ideal for water cooling and air cooling for new and old cards alike. Cryonaut paste is one of the top performing pastes for extreme overclocking with CPUs and GPUs and has been used in several world record scoring machines. Learn more at the link in the description below. So background on this one. Uh, again, $1,750. It's got an RTX 2060 Super in it. It has an i7-10700. Technically, it was a 10700F in the advertising, but uh, we got the 10700. It has four fans, a Gungnir extremely restricted case, and some other standard parts. MSI makes motherboards and video cards, so as you would expect, those are the parts they've put in the pre-built system. Sadly, though, uh, despite having components that are desirable, like the silicon components, the system is executed in such a poor way that it really feels like it's just stealing things from the greater market that could be more useful elsewhere. And the weird thing is, MSI is theoretically capable of building a computer, so we don't know what happened here. This, this shouldn't exist. It's really bizarre. Anyway, even outside of the software stuff, like the fact that the OS is nukeable when you first get it because it's that far gone, uh, the hardware is also problematic. Uh, internally, at least, it's not proprietary parts, so we're a step above Dell there, but we wouldn't say that it's better than Dell. It does not get that award. This computer is far worse than the Dell system we got for other reasons. Let's get started with the teardown. We'll talk about the thermals, gaming performance, everything else. Uh, and the section you should really watch is the one about BIOS and software setup towards the end because that's where it's eye-opening. The intake, if you were wondering, it's, it's in here. This, um, let me just, hang on. Does our camera have enough zoom to get the, can we get a macro shot of the intake? So the intake, there's these little, maybe one millimeter cuts in the side of this plastic panel. That's where the air comes in. Um, if you're wondering, no, that's not sufficient. And uh, additionally, there are these small cuts on the sides, left and right, where the air comes in. So the case is not promising. We've been, we talked with MSI several times over the years about case design, and um, I guess what I've learned is that I won't waste my time in the future. The top is ventilated. It is set up without any fans. Uh, so I, I was actually going to make a comment that a dust filter is pointless when there's no intake to pull dust through the filter, except because of how closed off the front panel is, it might actually end up being an accidental intake because it's kind of running in a negative pressure setup since they've choked off all access to air at the front. So we'll look at that in the thermal section. For the system, let's just take it apart and see how it looks. What I'm interested in here is the build quality. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about component selection. That'll come up more in the performance section of the review. But build quality is what we're looking for. Basics like cable management all the way up to more important things like not having loose screws in it. This is something we've seen a lot recently. So here is the inside of the computer. Got the Vetri V5 there, which actually did pretty well in our testing. It is one of the cheapest coolers of its performance category right now. And we're actually, we were really impressed or surprised that uh, MSI went with this cooler because typically you see these large brands just sort of self-branding things or rebranding things. So it's kind of an interesting choice to not see an MSI branded cooler there. Uh, and then. The card we're going to have to take out and look at, I can't tell, this feels like a plastic backplate that is very unfortunate. 
but it's also something MSI loves doing. Let's take the front of the case off first, actually. I'm more interested in this. Okay, so this is a little bit comical, but they've got uh, the dust filter on the front panel here, and the dust filter is behind another dust filter, which is a solid wall. <laughs> so, um, tempered glass, plastic, and now you can better see the extent of the ventilation such that it exists. That, to their credit, is, is kind of open. I thought that was just going to be faked and hard plastic. Anyway, that's not great. Okay, we're going to start disassembling this. So I'm going to use some screwdrivers from the GN Toolkit on store.cameraxis.net if you'd like to grab one. They're in stock and shipping now. We're going to start with taking the video card out. They've run two separate cables for the PCIe. Oh. Nope. One single cable. They fooled me. I, I, thought, I thought they were wired separately. One single cable daisy chained for a PCIe. Uh, we prefer to see two separate cables, but this is a lower power card, so it's not that, imp it doesn't really matter for this one. The higher tier cards, uh, like a 3090, 3080, it's ideal to, to run two separate cables for the power headers. So the card is an RTX 2060 Super. Uh, as stated, it's unfortunately got the plastic backplate, so this not only doesn't really help with rigidity or anything, but it's also an insulator. Um, as long as they've got decent enough design on the front side, it won't hurt performance too much, but it definitely doesn't help. It will impact the thermals, typically uh, in, the, in this part of the board where you've got a bunch of concentration of high heat devices, memory modules, VRM components, things like that. It, this will insulate and bring up the temperature a little bit. Uh, you know, really, the, the th I would rather see these cards without a backplate at all than with a backplate that is detrimental to performance. So this, this MSI, this has been stupid, and it's still stupid, but it was really stupid on the RTX 3080. That was just offensive. At least this is only a 2060. It's not as offensive. But um, you know, I guess the learning lesson here for anyone watching is if you're looking at video cards and you're choosing between features like backplates or not, just be aware that some of them are, are BS. This does literally nothing useful. Uh, that's more of a critique on the card, though, than the build, although it is made by MSI. Get the cables unplugged. So far, there are some upsides here. So the upsides, the mortar, historically, uh, is a board that MSI actually produces for the DIY market. So this isn't some random proprietary garbage. So the board is normal. It's a micro ATX motherboard. You could take this out and put it in another case. You could harvest this entire system and put it in another system. You could take out the CPU, replace the CPU. Uh, there's flexibility here where you're basically buying just a DIY computer that was, that, that was deed by someone else, I guess. The, the dean happened elsewhere, which was at MSI's facility. So. That's a good thing. It means that you don't end up with the Dell level of uh, unusable trash where nothing's compatible with anything. So here's the board, CPU, and memory as assembled. The memory's in the correct slots. That's a good thing. There's two sticks. Crazy, right? Two whole sticks of RAM. Why would you do that when you could do one and completely artificially hamper the performance? So uh, they're running a DDR4 kit of Three DDR4 3000. Oh, funny. It's actually this 8GX4. It's actually from a kit of four originally, and they <laughs> split it apart. <laughs> Hopefully, we can reunite these two sticks with the other two that were once in their family before MSI ripped them from each other's arms to put them into different systems rather than buying a kit of two. But you got to save costs somewhere. All right, here's the thermal paste reveal. There it is. So, basically full coverage. The uh, unevenness in the spread you see is because of the Vetri, not because of MSI. But I like seeing that they applied enough paste to get it all around the IHS. That's nice. Using the whole IHS is beneficial, of course. More surface area to get the heat out of one device and into another. So, pretty good to see. Um, you can definitely see the uh, either either it's a difference in pressure where it wasn't mounted completely 
like torques the same on all four screws, or it's a uh, cold plate flatness. Not going to bother testing it on this one. We've already reviewed this cooler, but you can see where these two heat pipes have a lot less contact. I'm going to go ahead and say it's probably pressure um, from these two screws not being fully tensioned, but uh, less contact there than the rest of the place, but it's okay overall. And this is one of the better pre-built coolers we've seen on uh, a pre-built system. CPU is an i7-10700. So in this instance, going with the B460M board is fine. There's no K at the end of that CPU. It's not a 10700K. And so there's no benefit to be had from a Z series motherboard. So this, this is also okay. Check this out. See if you can see this on camera. So is that visible? So uh, as Kane Pin famously said in one of our videos, very famously, it was one of our videos after all, uh, it's bending like a banana. It's not bending like a banana. It's this SSD. What the hell are they doing to it? They, I mean, first of all, you can see from how the thermal pad is squished out here and not anywhere else. There's an obscene amount of pressure on that side. So that's perhaps the worst thing we've seen in the build so far. What is going on? Oh, yeah. <laughs> OK. Definitely contact with the thermal pad. Let's straighten back out. That, I mean, there's actually some risk there that there could be stress fractures either immediately or with time. It didn't straighten back out. It's actually it's going like up and then back down right in the middle. Anyway, this is the worst thing we've seen so far in this build, where it's just torqued to hell and kind of uh, bending the SSD's PCB, which could cause problems. Um, it worked like it was running, so Probably because it's solid state, it'll remain fine, but who knows, enough thermal cycles, maybe eventually it dies or something a little early. Overall, the assembly quality is far better than I expected based on how much we hate the software in the computer, which we'll talk about soon. Um, I guess, you know, it's, this has been on here for like the whole review at this point. Um, so I guess at this point we can just, anyway, let's get to the benchmark charts and see how this thing does. Now, after that teardown, we should probably start with some thermals because that was bad looking. The Aegis R might have some of the worst CPU thermals we've ever seen in a pre-built computer. The case is sealed. The air cooler is either terrible or mounted incorrectly. And in this case, we know the Vetri V5 is pretty good. So that speaks more to MSI's incompetence than anything else. The power limits are way over ambitious and we'll talk about that after we get to the gaming benchmarks and the MSI custom windows power plan is really screwed up in how it behaves where it tricks the system into thinking the CPU should be at 100% load and by the way the case fans are set to a static speed below their maximum in our baseline torture test the CPU attempted to maintain a 4.6 gigahertz all core boost throughout the entire 45 minute load period which is already incorrect so that's not what that CPU is supposed to do but it began thermal throttling 41 seconds after the all-core load was applied. Eventually, it settled on an average of 4.32 gigahertz, uh, which is way below what it should be. And even if MSI hadn't played fast and loose with the power limits, thermal throttling would still have occurred within the minute-long boost window. There was still throttling even in the two thermally advantaged configurations that we set up. One was with the front panel removed, the other one was with the front panel removed and the fans at max speed. But with the front panel removed, the sustained average was still just 4.41 gigahertz. This is an improvement, but remember, the CPU is trying to run at 4.6. With the fans maxed out and the panel removed, the CPU settled to an average of 4.46 gigahertz. Still not there. Now this next chart shows the GPU clock delta, or the change from one test to the next with the GPU frequency. GPU clocks over the same period revealed a similar but less extreme trend with a delta of about 20 megahertz from worst case uh, baseline test to the best case results with max fans and no front panel. And here's a bar chart with some of the temperatures. CPU temperatures really stole the show here. GPU temperatures hit a steady state of 72C and hotspot temperature of 85C, but those numbers are under control. The GPU was able to control its own temperatures effectively with its two fans in spite of the restrictive case design. We did two further test passes, one without the front panel and one 
without the front panel and the fans in this setup as well. And we can basically skip discussing those, but you can see them here where even with the front panel gone and every fan in the case spinning as fast as possible, the CPU hit 100 degrees Celsius after one minute. This is so beyond unacceptable for the price of this computer. It's, it's unbelievable how poorly this is built. As for GPU temperatures, they at least benefited slightly from the change with a steady state temperature of 65C and a hotspot of 76, but clearly GPU thermals aren't the main problem with this system. And they might not be a problem just because the CPU is throttling so hard that the GPU isn't even getting enough instructions to run up the heat load. Take a look at game benchmarks for the MSI Aegis. As a reminder, gaming and the benchmarks you'll see here, it's really more a factor of the GPU and the CPU, which are made by other companies, than it is the pre-built manufacturer. So if the performance is bad, it's actually just a really impressive indication that the pre-built manufacturer does horrible things to its parts when it tries to install them. All right, Cyberpunk's up first. Cyberpunk 2077 at 1080p medium has the Aegis R right where we expected it. It's at 92 FPS average and nearly tied with the 90 FPS average of the HP Pavilion. That's another system with a 2060 Super. That's not a great starting point, given that we paid $320 more for the Aegis than the HP box, or uh, that there's a dismal 2% performance increase in this scenario for 22% price increase. To be clear, we're not recommending the, what we called embarrassingly bad pavilion, but in a straight performance per dollar contest between just these two PCs, the pavilion wins. The systems we tested are frequently GPU bottlenecked in games, and spending the extra money to get a 10700 doesn't make much difference in those instances. The Lenovo Legion is the next step down on the chart and contains the same CPU as the Aegis R, but the Legion 1660 Super puts it in a significantly lower performance tier at 66 FPS average. Still, it achieves 72% of the performance at $700 cheaper. So there's a lot of value there. Cyberpunk and Red Dead are two of the more graphically intensive games in this suite, with Red Dead Redemption 2 showing us better scaling for the Aegis R. In this one, there's an 11% advantage over the Pavilion, but MSI's position on the chart remains unchanged. Rainbow Six Siege at 1080p pushed frame rates high enough to generate some impressive coil wine, but that was really the only thing truly impressive about it. The end result was a 255 FPS average, which lands right above the HP Pavilion again, and right behind the more expensive, but far more impressive in terms of mechanical engineering, Beast Canyon Nuck, equipped with a 3060. For a game like Siege, this level of hardware really isn't necessary. A system like the ABS Challenger with a 10400F and 1660 Super is more than enough, as well as being $750 cheaper. However, if you're interested in higher frame rates, the Pavilion and Beast Canyon Nuck alike show that the Aegis isn't anything special. Running with our higher graphics settings and 1440p instead, the MSI Aegis ends up at 171 FPS average now, and that's with the lows still proportionally spaced. The Beast Canyon Nuck maintains a lead, although it's largely an irrelevant one. It's mostly just interesting for its better overall component selection, engineering, uh, and the size, the form factor, but it's more expensive. The Pavilion maintains its spot close to the Aegis while obviously still maintaining its price advantage. The results of our Blender power test required some explanation this time. Depending on BIOS settings, the Intel CPUs typically show an immediate power spike in consumption when the test begins, followed by a sharp drop off as the tau period expires and the CPU settles to its long-term power limit. MSI opted to set that 255 watt constant limit <laughs> So the drop-off never happened. Instead, the system's power draw maxed out at 275 watts and then dropped down to an average of 264 watts as the CPU began to thermal throttle again after 30 seconds. Compare this to the Legion T5's 10700, which didn't thermal throttle and therefore outperformed the one we're looking at from MSI, and uh, that system dropped down to 102 watts after the initial boost period. Our gaming benchmarks are shorter, lighter CPU workloads than Blender is, so we didn't encounter any thermal throttling during this portion of power testing. We did encounter some of the highest full system power draw numbers we've seen in a pre-built so far, with an average of 345 watts in Rainbow Six Siege and 357 in Cyberpunk. That puts it on par with the much higher performance and higher spec Skytech Kronos which means that MSI is extremely inefficient in its performance. Moving on to setup and instructions. The remove foam warning on the side of the case is clearly visible, so that's nice. And unlike IY Power, MSI actually put some foam inside. The system is housed in an MPG Gungnir 110R, which is a case that comes with four 120mm fans and a big pane of glass to make sure they can't do anything useful. MSI makes other variants of the Gungnir, several of which are better ventilated, but it seems like those models rarely make their way into Aegis systems. 
They wouldn't want to accidentally make a good computer, so we can't fault them for that. The best thing we can say about this case is that it's easier to get the front panel off than it looks, so cleaning the front filter isn't a hassle but you'll also never need to clean it because the fans don't pull anything in. In addition to the usable but not exciting mouse and keyboard, the accessory kit contains a power cord, SATA cables, and wireless antenna. With systems from SIs that don't manufacture their own parts, we get practically every loose bit of paper and hardware from the retail boxes of various components. But because MSI can source parts directly from the factory, we're missing the usual manuals, driver, discs, and spare case screws. It's not really a big deal, but it is inconvenient for anyone who plans to do their own maintenance or upgrades in the future. We received an i7-10700 rather than the 10700F we paid for, which is a nice bonus. We've seen this kind of part substitution based on stock before, where if you buy a pre-built, it's definitely worth checking each component against the invoice to see if anything has been altered. This isn't the first time we've had that happen. In this case, it was an upgrade though. The 10700's IGP isn't incredibly useful compared to the discrete 2060 Super that's included, but it does allow using Intel features like QSV or connecting displays to video ports on the motherboard for troubleshooting, so that's good. Time to talk about software and BIOS. XMP was not applied in BIOS, so the provided memory ran at 2666. The vast majority of pre-builds we've tested don't come with XMP enabled, even when they do list the XMP frequency on the spec sheet. One defense for not enabling XMP is that it's technically overclocking and would theoretically void Intel's warranty, assuming they cared enough to check and treated the manufacturers the same as the rest of us. But that argument doesn't hold any water with pre -built. If the system blows up in any capacity, it's getting returned to MSI. Not Intel. This is lazy and pointless, and we're tired of fighting this fight. MSI clearly isn't omitting XMP out of some desire to keep the hardware safe or to obey Intel guidelines, because if it were, it wouldn't be toasting CPUs at 100 degrees Celsius, and it wouldn't be customizing the power plant. This is obviously just laziness or stupidity. We're not sure which one, but it's definitely not to protect the parts. When testing pre-built systems, we select the high-performance power plant in Windows, Usually, systems ship with the default balanced plan, but with the loads we use for testing, it really doesn't change much. And selecting high performance is just consistent with our CPU and GPU testing in the case we want to cross-check results. We made an exception for this MSI system because it included a mode called Ultra Performance, which the system dynamically toggles on when under load. Far be it from us to stand in the way of MSI screwing itself over, so we left that one on. During sustained lightly threaded workloads, like transferring a large file, Ultra Performance toggles itself on. That's when you need it, apparently, and it tells Windows to pretend that the CPU is at 100% utilization. What this does is it causes Windows to incorrectly report 100% load on all threads. Hardware info, for example, continues to show the true load, which is barely anything. Because of this, the CPU runs at its all-core turbo speed of 4.6 GHz. But this is actually lower than the 10700's max single-core turBO of 4.8 GHz. Since MSI's default settings have PL1 and PL2 set to 255 watts, or in MSI terminology, liquid cooler, uh, it sustains that the all-core 4.6 GHz speed should last for as long as the file is transferring. This means that the CPU package temperature could hit steady state in the mid-60s Celsius just from dragging and dropping a file. And it's not even allowed to hit max boost. MSI proves that you can not have your cake and not eat it too. But it doesn't end there. Norton is here as well. It stepped up its game this time with the antivirus presence. Typically, this pre-installed antivirus package would be just AdWord that exists to sell itself. And Norton's no exception from how others work, but it did go above and beyond this time, and it did so by blocking a simple batch script that we use to move results files. It also let us know that every file involved in a Steam install was safe, one at a time. Literally, one at a time. It also gave us a warning about high disk usage, because if anything can make you feel better while your system is chugging with a hard drive pinned at 100% load, it's a friendly pop-up from Norton. We found Norton to be even more obnoxious than McAfee here, and that's really saying something. There's plenty more pre-installed bullshit on this system too. There's an app called Duet Display that tried to set itself up on first boot and has launched its startup ever since. There's tons of MSI RGB related processes. There's the MSI voice control service. Maybe they're listening to this review before we publish it. Anyway, there's also, uh, because we made the mistake of opening it one single time, the ever-present Xbox app, but that's more of a Microsoft fault. 
The first time we booted the system, it spent a few minutes applying Windows updates despite having not been connected to the internet or LAN at all. It apparently went out the door with some updates downloaded and queued, but not installed, which is just bad attention to detail. The pre-installed NVIDIA driver was 466.27, which shipped in April 2021, as did the BIOS version installed on the board. Those are more recent than we typically see in pre-builds, especially given that the OS appears to have been installed in July and the system shipped to us uh, in October and we started using it in December of last year. So points to MSI here for keeping things up to date. So concluding this one then, we normally do just some quick bullet points for the conclusion and then I mostly ad lib it because we're experienced enough working with the product by the time we get to the end that it's easy to figure out what to say. Well, this one, the bullet points are even simpler than normally. Uh, we have two sections, one's called good, one's called bad. And under bad, it just says bad. <laughs> so that gives you an idea of where we are with this. Awful thermals, 100 degrees Celsius on the CPU. The GPU is dropping clocks a bit as well. Uh, this is totally unacceptable for a system which is pre-built. The entire point of pre-built is that they don't make these types of mistakes because they control every component in the system. That's the whole point. It's all controlled, so you don't have to worry as a customer if it's thermal throttling or not. So that's already insane. The power limits they've set for the CPU make no sense for the cooler that's on here. The Windows Power Profile it behaves like a power virus, so that's not good either. Norton behaves like a virus, as you would expect. Uh, and then there's the other stuff on there we talked about that is intrusive too. So thermals are bad. Uh, very inappropriate combination of the CPU cooler with the BIOS settings for the CPU. The Vetri V5 is a pretty good cooler. We've reviewed it. We liked it overall. But it's not supposed to be paired with like 200 watts. That's not the thing it's for. <laughs> so what the hell, MSI? You make liquid coolers. You could have... MSI has set the power profile on this to a setting that MSI, in its own BIOS, calls liquid cooler. Instead of using a number, they use the word liquid cooler, and then they put an air cooler on it. And not even a particularly high-end one. So, uh, obviously, the conclusion is don't buy it. Under the category of good, we wrote these notes. The software and BIOS is up to date. And um, that's it. So, there's another note that says no obvious flaws in assembly, but then we saw the Bent SSD. So, uh, almost no obvious flaws in assembly. The biggest upside is no proprietary parts. So worst case scenario, you could buy this, hopefully on the second hand market, because someone realized it's not very good, and then strip the parts out of it and use them in something you build yourself where you install your own OS that's not bloated and filled with trash, and you use a case that doesn't suck, uh, and a power limit that's appropriate for the CPU cooler. Then you would have something workable. but. Even the HP Pavilion that we reviewed, which we don't recommend either, by the way, that would be a better buy than this. Uh, the Intel NUX that are just really good mechanically engineered uh, small form factor boxes, they're expensive, but those make far more sense than these do, despite the price of the NUX. Uh, there's plenty of it. SkyTech and ABS have had good options we've looked at. Uh, CyberPower has options that are better than some of the ones we've looked at. Those would be worth considering. But you know, even you buy from CyberPower, CyberPower, we've had problems with both of them. From Dell, we've had problems with. But you don't get something quite this bad most of the time. This is a combination of things that each of those companies has done bad independently, except it puts them all into one box. So don't buy this. It's garbage. That's it for this one. Thanks for watching. Subscribe for more toys. You can go to store.gamersnexus.net. If you'd like to help us directly with reviewing this type of thing, or patreon.com slash gamersnexus. And um, yeah, I don't know. We'll figure out what to do with this one. It's a dumpster out there. So don't worry. We're not actually going to throw it. We'll give it to someone in pieces. <laughs> That's how it's better. All right. See you all next time.